Okay. Um, our next section. Our next back speaker is Mark Marco. Marco is the co-founder and CTO of Kong, the most um uh, widely adapted open source API platform. Um, today he wants to share about uh topic. Uh, talk about the application and service connectivity. Uh, welcome to Marco. Welcome. Hello, welcome. Can you hear me well? Yeah, I can. I can hear you clearly. Perfect. Can you share your screen? Um, yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I'll share my screen in a second. Uh, let me see. There we go. Can you yeah, see I the can, slide? I can see a slide. Yeah, clearly. Um, this is your time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Marco Palladino. I'm the CTO and co-founder of Kong. Kong is uh, a company that provides uh, open source infrastructure for API gateways and service meshes. And so today we're going to be talking about this new era that we're seeing today when we build our software. We're transitioning away from a place where you know, our software was monolithic and in, in building large code bases to a place where our software is distributed and decoupled. And, um, and in this transition from monolithic to microservices really is the transition from CPU to network. And so today we're going to be addressing some of the challenges that this new era is bringing in the way we build and connect our software. So first and foremost, we know that every business is becoming digital. And in 2020, um, with, with all that's happened this year, for many organizations, there's been a wake-up call to accelerate their digital transformation. The world and the future, it is going to be digital. And the thing is, as soon as our products become digital, we need to make sure that they are, they are reliable. And so to do that, we distribute our software across multiple regions, multiple clouds. We want to be highly available. And perhaps in order to, to accelerate how much faster we're shipping, we're going to be decoupling our software in smaller components in microservices, for example. And the thing about decoupling and distributing our software is that it creates over time more and more service connectivity. So there is a there is a couple of changes that really are happening here. We're transitioning away from centralized, static, monolithic code bases and applications into decentralized and dynamic applications that are made up with lots of services. And the number of services, it is going to be increasing the more applications we create and the more teams are going to be creating more digital products. Now, what has worked very well in a centralized and static world, it is not what's going to work us and bring us to this dynamic decentralized world where we're going to be running across modern platforms and containers and Kubernetes and perhaps even distributing our software across multiple clouds. And so today I want to focus on, on one of the biggest challenges that these new decentralized architectures are bringing to the table that are going to make it or break it when it comes to our digital strategy. The more services we have, and the bigger the requirement, it is to connect all of them together. And that is by definition, it's inevitable. Every time a team creates an application, they create connectivity. And this allows us to hire faster, specialized teams in specific services that, you know, as long as they consume and they offer an API, um, you know, we, we can avoid thinking about the implementations of these services and therefore, we can create them with different programming languages. We can innovate faster. But of course, there is also a drawback. And the drawback is that we're going to be introducing that connectivity that before, in a monolithic applications, we didn't have. In a monolith, we were running within the context of the CPU with function calls within the code base. And now we're transitioning that CPU reliability with service connectivity. And this picture really exemplifies what I just said. We're transitioning away from in-process function calls. Our monolith would build different concerns and these different objects, these different resources would communicate with each other thanks to the underlying 
primitives that our monolith would provide. And so, for example, in a Java in a Java application, the Java virtual machine would make sure that our function calls can communicate effectively across different areas of the monolith. Now, of course, as we transition that to different services, um, we introduce service connectivity and we introduce APIs that may not necessarily be just HTTP APIs, but they're going to be whatever protocol and transport we think it is going to be better and best for the kind of uh, for the kind of job that we're trying to accomplish here. And so it could be an HTTP API, it could be gRPC, it could be an event-based microservice architectures. And long story short, we're going to be having APIs and interfaces that the services are going to be using to communicate with each other. Now, even in a monolithic world, we had connections and connectivity. And even in a monolithic world, that connectivity was critical. So for example, when a monolith was talking to a database, if that connection failed, well, we had a critical failure into, into our application that potentially could create problems with the end users and the end consumers. So we always had connectivity, but the difference between back then and now is that now we have a lot of connectivity. It's much more, the scale is so much bigger. So what was working before in a monolith with smaller, with with with, uh, with larger code bases and relatively smaller um, services dependencies, it is not going to work anymore when we are going to be introducing more and more services in the future as we build more and more applications. And, and the thing about service connectivity really is about all of the requirements that the network brings to the table when we want to connect these different systems together. We want that connectivity to be encrypted. We want it to be secure. We want to be able to create a zero trust security model that allows us to identify every service that's running within our systems in such a way that if the service is not authorized or it's not the right service for, uh, you know, to make that request, we should prevent them that request from working in the first place. And as a matter of fact, with microservices, we can improve security as long as we have the right tooling and infrastructure in place, because we can apply more fine-grained rules as to what services and what resources can change the state of other resources. With monolithic applications, if you had access to the code base, you could create any resources or change the state of anything that's within the scope of the monolith with no many checks in place. So with microservices, because we can apply more fine-grained rules, we can increase the security as long as we have the right infrastructure in place. And so encrypting the, the traffic, assigning an identity to each one of these services, being able to uh, determine traffic ACLs, so what service is allowed to consume what service and in what region, in what cloud, in what platform. Being able to route our services uh, to implement versioning, to implement canary releases in a consistent way across all of the applications, across all the teams, that that we need to support as architects as part of their journey, uh, as well as being able to uh, support blue-green deployments and observability logging and tracing to determine if the problems are happening on the network layer as opposed to the in the actual services themselves. And 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 the, and the observability observability aspect cannot be stressed hard enough. Um, in, in a monolith, when there is a problem and there is a bug we have a nice stack trace that tells us exactly where the problem is and where to look at. Of course, in a distributed and decoupled architecture, the problem may very well not be in the services themselves. It may be in the transport that connects the services. And so in order to figure out if, if the problems are happening on the transport, we must have tracing, we must have metrics on the actual connectivity among all these different services. And so on and so forth. So being able also to implement chaos engineering practices in order in order to harden our our distributed distributed architecture. It's also practice that happens in this new in this new era of building software. And so all of these all of these requirements are are going to be important to figure out before the teams are going to be re-implementing these in their own programming languages, in their own services, over and over again, creating fragmentation. So for example, let's say that I am a team even building a monolith. In a traditional monolith, um, you know, if I'm making a request to a third-party dependency or a or or to a service, um, me as a as a as a developer building the monolith, I am in charge of not only building the products, but then when I make those requests, I am in charge of making sure that they are secure, making sure they are observable, making sure that if there are problems, we can retry the request and so on and so forth. Of course, if we have more and more services or more and more applications, now we're going to be having a situation where 
multiple teams are going to be creating over and over again that connectivity management, that connectivity security across different implementations, across different services, and that they're going to be reinventing the wheel. Plus, the job of the application team really should not be managing this connectivity. Their job is building the products, building, making the users happy, making the customers happy. They are losing efficiency every time they build extra code that manages the infrastructure, whereas they would expect that infrastructure to come out of the box uh, from the underlying provisioning of the environment. And so multiple teams are going to be creating connectivity functionality across different services and different monoliths. And the more services we have, and the more and the more fragmentation we're going to be having. This is very real. If we do not make sure that our connections among all the services is safe, is secure, is reliable, then our applications are not going to be reliable as well. Uh, when the connectivity is down, our applications are down. And when the applications are down, our business is down. So it's very important that as part of our transformation journey, we determine what is the strategy we're going to adopt to take care of this connectivity so that the application teams don't have to build it themselves. Because when they build it themselves, they create fragmentation and they create poor implementations. It creates security problems, it creates uh, scalability problems, it lowers the performance because different teams are going to be doing things with, with, with different implementations, therefore uh, different languages and therefore different performances as well. It's going to be creating a very unreliable infrastructure for our applications to run. And unreliable connectivity creates problems and errors at runtime. It is important that connectivity as we are onboarding this journey of creating decoupled and distributed architectures, it is being taken care of. And so, for example, uh, if you look at the different connectivity use cases that we have as architects to, to provide to the application teams, we can primarily identify three different connectivity types. First and foremost, we're going to be having connectivity at the edge. So the application teams are building um, products and, and apps, and eventually some of these applications are going to be consumed at the edge. They're going to be consumed by, for example, a mobile app, or they're going to be consumed by an ecosystem of, of partners. And, and, and as we do that, we must provide that connectivity at the edge to enter the applications from outside of the organization. Then we're going to be having more and more cross-application connectivity across all the applications within the organizations that the teams are creating, as well as we transition to microservices. Some of these applications will transition away from being monoliths, and we're going to be having more and more connectivity inside of the applications. So let's take a look at one of the solutions, for example, that we can um, implement for that last use case, the in-app connectivity. So let's say that our, our teams are creating services. And as they are creating services, because there is nothing in place, they're going to be creating that connectivity management themselves. So they build more code to manage errors in the connections, to retry the connections, to secure the connections. But what if, what if we extracted that functionality in such a way that we can offer it as a separate executable, as a separate runtime, that now, because it's an executable in, 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 a, in a runtime, it's a binary, it becomes portable. So we can run it alongside any service that any team is creating. So instead of having this functionality being rewritten every time, it is being decoupled into a separate binary. And this separate binary can act, for example, as a proxy for any outgoing requests that our services are making. So if the request needs to be secured, that binary can secure it for us. If that request needs to be observed, that binary can observe it for us. And because we want that latency between the service and the binary to be as small as possible, we're going to be making sure that the binary always run on the same underlying host as where the services are running. And so it can be the same pod, it can be the same virtual machine, it's the same underlying host. Now, because we want to enable one of the use cases, it's zero trust security or out of the box tracing, we also want to have the same binary to receive the request on the other end so that we can then the contact points, the touch points between these connections are not the services themselves, but these binaries. And these binaries are going to be enforcing that zero trust security, that routing for us, that observability for us. This is a very common pattern. And if, if you're familiar with, with, with modern, modern uh, connectivity patterns, you know exactly where I'm going. And if you're not, I'm going to be revealing that to you in a couple of minutes. 
So uh, we don't have to build this binary ourselves. There is projects out there that we can use that are already in charge of managing that connectivity for us. And for example, one of them is Envoy Proxy, which is a C++ proxy for L4 and L7 traffic that has been built uh, by Lyft and contributed by many organizations out there, uh, like Google, like Salesforce, like, like Red Hat, that are now using this technology to secure that connectivity. Now, when it comes to in-app connectivity, like I said, we want to be having these proxies, um, this binary acting as a proxy for outgoing requests and as a reverse proxy for incoming requests. And we can put this in front of anything, in front of a database, in front of a service, in front of anything that can make or receive a request over the network. Now, of course, the more services we have and the more, more of these binaries we're going to be having running around. So it is important that the binaries are actually very small. The binaries are in charge of connecting the services. The services will make the request. The binary will intercept this request because it's a proxy and then let these requests go to the intended destination. Now, the more of these binaries we have and the biggest the challenges are when it comes to configuring them. And so this is where I'm going to be introducing to you the concept of data plane and control plane. The binaries that I've just introduced are effectively data plane proxies, right? They are on the execution path of our requests. And every time we want to change our traffic permission in CL, our observability, our tracing rules, we do not want to manually do that on each one of these different uh, data plane proxies because the more we have and the harder it is to do that, we want to be able to configure them in a dynamic way. And we want to do that via control plane. So the control plane becomes the source of truth of the configuration that we want to, 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 to push to all these data plane proxies that are in charge of managing that runtime connectivity. The control plane is never on the execution path of, of the actual API requests. It is only going to be used to configure and control the data plane proxies, but the requests are never hitting the control plane itself. They're going through, through this uh, data plane layer. And, uh, and, and just like that, really, we've introduced one of the most common patterns to address in-app connectivity in modern architectures. And this is service mesh. Service mesh um, is a pattern that basically requires a proxy to run alongside every replica of every service. It is platform agnostic because it's a separate binary. Therefore, we can push it inside uh, next to any service that our teams are creating, regardless of what technology they're using. And then the control plane, it is going to be configuring how that connectivity is being managed across L4 to L7, um, across all the dependencies of our, uh, of our applications. Now, Kong uh, has built a control plane that you can use for doing that out of the box. Uh, that control plane is Kuma, and you can check it out at kuma.io. And it's an open source control plane. It's Envoy based, and it's the uh, first Envoy based control plane to ever be donated to the CNCF. So it's a CNCF sandbox project that you can use today to create reliable and safe connectivity um, with a service mesh across any cloud, any platform, any environments, Kubernetes and virtual machine included. It provides a very unique set of features like multi mesh, first class support for VMs. Uh, on both the data plane and the control plane, as well as the best multi-zone support that the industry has ever seen when it comes to automatically supporting cross-cluster, cross-zone and cross-region and cross-cloud connectivity for our services. So it's it's a very unique, and um, I, I strongly suggest you, you check it out if you are if you are trying to implement reliable connectivity within your applications. And this is what service mesh really is. And so we said that we're going to be having, you know, in-app is only one of the connectivity use cases we're going to be having. There's going to be edge connectivity, there's going to be cross-application connectivity, um, and there's going to be in-app connectivity across all of our applications. Like I said, the monoliths also have connectivity at a smaller scale. As more, the more decoupled and the more distributed they become, and the more that scale becomes bigger across any platform that the teams are going to be using. We must support this connectivity across all the platforms that the application teams are using. Otherwise, as soon as we introduce a new platform that we don't support, that's when the application teams start doing what they should not be doing, managing the connectivity. We should provide that connectivity out of the box as we provision the environment for the applications. The teams should not do that. And as a result of that, the teams becomes more efficient, whereas the architects get more control on what is effectively the backbone on, of every modern application. 
connectivity. Um, and, and you know, for in-app connectivity, we can use service mesh, and for edge and cross-app connectivity, we can use either edge gateways or internal gateways that are going to be working very nicely with a service mesh, if a service mesh is being used, in order to determine what services we're going to be exposing, either to uh, a client outside of the organization or to a client, to another application within the organization. And, um, and at Kong, we've done lots of work to build uh, open source foundations as well as enterprise products and platforms that can help create these uh, full stack connectivity from gateway to mesh uh, across any cloud, any platform, uh, any region. And we're working today with the 250 plus enterprise customers as well as millions of instances of our software uh, in the open source community to power all of these different connectivity use cases at the edge, cross app and service mesh um, across pretty much any application. Um, and and because, because both Kong and Kuma have been created by the same uh, original contributor, which is Kong, uh, we also made sure that there is a native integration across these products so that we, we don't have to figure it out how to make them work together. They just work together out of the box. And, and this is very important as we try to accelerate the development speed and as we try to accelerate the connectivity uh, reliability within our systems. So today uh, we, have, um, we have addressed the challenges of this new era of software. As we transition to more and more services, there's going to be more and more connectivity. Reliable connectivity, it is going to be essential for reliable applications running in this modern world. And in order to address these three use cases of connectivity, at the edge, cross app, and in app, we have explored how we can use a service mesh pattern to do that and how that, that can work very well with the API gateways as well in order to provide the, the full stack and, and cover all of these connectivity use cases. Um, so thank you so much. And uh, if you have any questions, I believe there is a Q&A session right now that, um, that, that we can use. And uh, if you have any questions on, on, on Kong and on Kuma or on service mesh in general or on gateway in general, you can visit konghq.com. There is plenty of material. There is installation for the products that you can try and, and build yourself. So thank you so much. Thank you, Marco. Uh, it's a very informative presentation. Uh, we will jump to the Q&A section. Um, uh, Marco, uh, can you talk more about uh, how the differences uh, of API gateways and the and the, the surface mesh we are talking about when we apply to the hybrid or multi cloud environment? Yes, um, this is a, this is an amazing question. Uh, so I'll be happy to clarify it for for everybody. Um, so when it comes to when it comes to gateways and when it comes to service mesh, service mesh it's more of a networking concern. So it's much lower level than the API gateway. API gateways are about creating an abstraction layer so that we can expose a subset of our services through APIs that are going to be having user governance flows and onboarding flows to enable people to consume them. The service mesh, it's much more closer to the metal, if you wish. Uh, it's much more closer to the actual network connectivity. And, and it creates this network overlay across every service from a network standpoint. So we can secure that connectivity on the network. We can observe that connectivity on the network. And then once we have this connectivity overlay, we can choose what services we want to offer via an API gateway, which is going to be enforcing user policies and governance policies on how that consumption should be happening by either an internal or an external user. Plus at the edge, when it comes to external clients outside of the organization, service mesh is not an applicable pattern. pattern. Uh, service mesh to work needs a sidecar, but we cannot force sidecars in certain environments, like for example, mobile applications that are consuming our APIs, and we cannot force a sidecar with an external partner because deploying a sidecar, it's something that's very close to how the developers are building and deploying their software. And even if our third-party developers could deploy a sidecar, we don't want their sidecar to talk to our control plane because our control plane, ideally, it is a very sensitive component that we want to run in a private subnet. You know, we don't want to have external connections to it. So for example, at the edge, service mesh is not an applicable pattern, but uh, we can use the service mesh and the gateway together like bread and butter. Uh, they go very well together to create this network overlay that secures the uh, protocol and the transports of our services 
and then use the gateway to determine which subset of these services we want to expose and create an abstraction layer so that even when the services are changing under the hood, we're not breaking those uh, uh, external clients because we're creating a compatibility layer that keeps that uptime of the clients, even if we, we reshuffle or, or change the underlying services in, in the mesh. Um, it, it is important to understand that mesh and gateways can work across Kubernetes, can work across multiple clouds, they can work across multiple regions. And we at Kong, we've been doing lots of work to make sure that the technologies Kuma and, and Kong, they can run in this capacity. So they can run natively in Kubernetes with CRDs, uh, but they can also run on virtual machines with access to declarative configuration and, and an HTTP API. Yeah, well, I understand. Uh, I think that both of the colleges is great, but they are covering different areas. Um, thank you to Marco today. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, our thank next you. Sec 